The Redemption of Babel, a devotional for the season of Lent, produced by Northside Church. Thursday, March 30th. Our scripture passage today comes from Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. The kingdom of God is often pictured as a wedding banquet in the teachings of Jesus in places like here in Revelation. We've all been to weddings and enjoyed the atmosphere of bringing friends and family together to celebrate the union of two people in holy matrimony. There are truly few other events in our lives that compare. Why do you think this metaphor of a wedding banquet was one of Jesus' favorite to use about the kingdom of God? What image does this metaphor hold for you? What's the best wedding you've ever been to? What made it so great? Take a moment to imagine receiving an engraved invitation to the wedding banquet of the kingdom of God. How would that feel? What do you think it'll be like? What's the difference between that imagined experience and the best wedding you've been to? This week on the Dialogic Disciple Podcast, Elizabeth and I sat down with Michael Devine, and we would like to share a part of that conversation with you here today. If you want to hear more, you can listen and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Well, uh, one of the um, most fascinating things to me about this is the power of metaphor. And Mm. I bet, Michael, as someone in music, you know a lot about that. I mean, just the, you know, we get this picture of the great prostitute, the city. And, you know, there are certain metaphors, particularly ones like that, that I think can be harmful, you know, if you take them the wrong way. But um, this is a very powerful metaphor for the time and for the audience that was hearing it, right? This idea of unfaithfulness and how we are pulled away from God. God. You know, we're in this covenant relationship with God and we are seduced away. Uh, it's just, it's, it's a powerful metaphor once you get down to the, you yeah. know, the base of it, of what it's really trying to say. Well, in addition to metaphor, I think one of the other huge parts about this story, and James, you touch on this a lot in different ways in the devotional writings for this week, is the historical context in which mm. that metaphor is understood yes. and heard and now today read. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea of this being, you know, understood by people who lived through exile or, or not maybe they didn't live but mm-hmm. a culture that experienced exile yes, yeah. and what that means for us today uh what it meant for the jews and jewish christians uh, hearing these words from john and revelation yeah. at the time uh, is is all it, it adds to the metaphor itself as the historical context right right and just to let everyone know we're, we're talking about um the revelation passage that starts with revelation 17 and we mm-hmm. jump around in 18 as well um, but this idea that uh, John, in, through this revelation, he is describing he's describing Rome as Babylon, 
and he is talking about how Babylon is this is this prostitute uh, that seduces people away from faithfulness to God. Um, <clears throat> Babylon is a is a city that casts a huge shadow over most of the Old Testament and, and some of the New Testament as well. It really you understand Babylon in Scripture to be almost like this this spirituality of unfaithfulness, you know, or at least a threat of unfaithfulness, of, of being seduced away from, uh, as you were talking about Elizabeth, away from um, the faithfulness to God and, and committing adultery with the world, I guess, it basically is the way that he talks about it here. Um, we, Michael, you and I were talking beforehand about this idea of being in exile. Yeah. And uh, I think... Uh, <laughs> I, I would say that we today live in a very similar situation. I think that the early Christians did in the sense that culturally uh, we live in, in a new Babylon. Um, and this is something that I, I wrote in the devotional, but it's something that I think a lot of Christians have drawn back to over the course of 2,000 years. Any power, any cultural power that glorifies itself rather than God is Babylon. And so the the, the issue is, you know, we as Christians are under the same threat of intoxication and seduction away from a faithful relationship with God. And we were talking about this a little bit before, Mm -hmm. um, and this kind of being in that, that mind space. Um, I I don't know. What do you, let's, let's dive into it. I, I, I think beyond any specificity of, uh, you know, as, as you've even put it in your devotional Atlanta or America Mm -hmm. as, as question marks, I think the broader implication of exile, especially as the way as it's described in Revelation, and also as a, in Peter, you think you referenced yes, as well, yeah. um, doing it this week, is that it's any culture that is anything other than the kingdom of God. Yeah. Uh, the the notion that the language of kingdom itself would have been shockingly revolutionary to. To, to the people reading this at the time, think yeah. anything beyond Rome. Mm-hmm. And so I don't think it's necessarily writing specifically just at Rome or just at Babylon or for us today, just at America yeah. or even broadly the West. It, it, right. it is anything beyond the kingdom of God. Yeah, that's good. Um, I, I think, of course, that has implications for what does that mean for us today? Uh-huh. And, yeah. and, and there are, I, I do think that there are some specific, uh, parallels between Rome and America that should give us a little bit of pause, mm-hmm. particularly around the notion of um, peace uh, mm-hmm. of the empire. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I mean that kind of in, in a positive way, of course, yeah. but uh, the, the notion of um, Rome being an empire that was so feared that it sort of caused, you know, this, this multi-hundred year peace yeah. on yeah. earth. Mm-hmm. Um, through its military strength, mm-hmm. mm. that sounds like something else that we have today. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, and that's that's not an inherently bad thing, but it is a, a particular parallel that we can draw on absolutely. between culture and, and between time. And, and you can compare that with um, the kind of peace that is that is instilled or, or brought with the kingdom of God. As it's not, it is it's the same kind of peace in a sense, but it, it's. It's not created the same way. It's not, yeah. or at least that's not what God wants, right? It's not God. Right. It's not a fear of God's might and power. Well, we have to remember that all of the Old Testament, or excuse me, all of the New Testament was well, certainly the Old Testament as well. But <laughs> all the New Testament was not written at a time when Christians were anywhere close yes. or adjacent or in power, right? Mm-hmm. Um, right? And yet, especially today in the West, in America those of us living today have at least experienced moments where Christianity was power adjacent or in power itself. Yes, yes. Uh, it, in, in some ways, the whole conversion of Emperor Constantine oh. <laughs> is both the greatest uh, gift and biggest problem that Christianity probably ever faced yeah. and that we continue to live with today. Yeah. The notion that Christianity could spread um, because of the peace of Rome. Yeah. And in the same way, because of the peace exercise, let's call it by a, a American hegemony across the world, mm-hmm. the gospel can spread. Yeah. And yet that power is also one of the biggest corrupting influences on faith and culture, especially when it begins to slip away. Yeah. I just heard a survey literally today. Uh, Protestantism in the United States now stands at 37% of the culture. Uh unaffiliated, the whole nun category, yeah. is at 25%. Oh, wow. Just 15 years ago, uh, 
the Protestant population of America was in the 60 percentile. Right. So we're talking about a huge drop. And the notion of what that means for us today is very different because we are used and accustomed to the notion of, again, being at least power adjacent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And everything written to us in the New Testament in that regard is actually foreign. Yeah. Because the New Testament didn't experience any of that. Yeah. Uh, Paul didn't. Peter didn't. John yeah. didn't. Yeah. Um, and and so an exilic understanding is probably more important for us right now yeah. than it has ever been, even just in the three of our lifetimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one of the best stories, Old Testament stories, that I've encountered or sort of been revitalized with a little bit recently is the story of King Josiah. Mm. Okay. Um, Old the boy, Testament. The boy king. Uh-huh. And one of, in some ways, one of the last kings, not the last king, but one of the last kings before the Babylonian yes. sacking of Jerusalem, which yes. you mentioned here on in Monday's mm -hmm. lesson. Yeah. Uh, and I looked this up before I came to the podcast so I could have be somewhat informed. So, <laughs> jo jo Josiah died in 609 BC, mm -hmm. the sacking, the well, the first sacking of Jerusalem. There, there are two. There are the, two first, yeah. the first sacking is a 597. That's right. Yeah. So there, it's pretty close. Mm -hmm. um, but when Josiah was king, uh, his heart was softened toward God, and he instructed sort of a cleaning and reconstruction of the temple mm -hmm. and, and, and we'll know a lot of that story. My favorite part of that story is the, the, the discovery of the scroll, the yeah. discovery of the law. <laughs> the law. Yeah, and like, cool. what, what is this? And we, what in the world? And this huge revitalization and at the same time, this realization of, oh my goodness, destruction is coming. Yeah, yeah. And we may not be able to stop it. Mm -hmm. And in fact... By the time that Josiah is killed and then his sons are installed sort of as vassal kings, mm -hmm. ultimately Jerusalem does fall. Yeah. And 10,000 people are trucked off mm -hmm. to Babylon. Well, fat, keep, keep, keep fast forwarding the story and think about, okay, what are the seeds planted in Josiah's time? Realizing our culture is gone, our generation has gone. What what do we do now? What what what, do, what seeds do we plant? Yeah, mm -hmm. the grandchildren of that generation are Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Mm. Ah, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and the, and which is just as shocking of a story, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. and and the, the notion that what we do now in the midst of a culture that we read and go, oh, destruction is coming. Yeah, what 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 do we do? Um. We prepare Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah, that's really good. Um, and that that has been a real sort of, for me personally, a real shift in trying to understand place and culture, faith and culture, faith in this time, um, is thinking about what's the impact, yeah. not trying to s s save the culture for Christ, right. which is like the old, that that's the sort of language I would have grown up with, yeah, right? Yeah, me too, yeah. Um, that's not what we're actually called to. Yeah. Um, which is kind of disorienting. <laughs> <laughs>